afternoon, I'm uh, lame duck Dan Gelber, mayor of Miami Beach, and I'm with uh, another Dan, Dan Porterfield, who is from the Aspen Institute. Um, and we're here to uh, start this panel off and say a couple things about Aspen Ideas Climate. And I'll, I'll start, and I'll be brief, and then he'll be substantive, which is what we like to do. Um, uh, it must have been about three years ago. Um, I knew Dan, uh, Dan Porterfield and I used to play basketball in the early 90s. Um, I want to say we were much thinner, but yeah. he's still yeah. thinner, and I'm not. We levitated together. We levitated, yeah. um, but we we were um, we were basketball friends, and when I became, and uh, he he, it was a Rhodes Scholar game. Everybody in the game was a Rhodes Scholar, but me. Dan was a Rhodes Scholar. I was not, but fortunately, they played like Rhodes Scholars, so <laughs> it, it, I did well. Um, but we became friends, and a few years ago, I said, "What uh, could Aspen do?" in Miami Beach, and he said, we've been wanting to put together an annual uh, climate conference, not just something uh, temporary or not just a pop-up, but something that would have durability uh, because it doesn't look like this challenge is going away. So uh, we, we thought about what to do, and then he put together a team, and I uh, have uh, Michelle Berger, who's my team, uh, and, and, and uh, Danielle Mejia, and they put together, and the city, and we put together what I think is has become a very substantial climate conference here in the city. And I want to thank the Aspen Institute for trusting us to be, a, to be the host city for what I think is a pretty important thing. Um, it's amazing what's happened over the last two years and what will happen this year. Last year we had two or three, three how many, Michelle? 2,000, 3,000? 3, 3,000 attendees, uh, over 50 conversations, uh, some of the most significant voices uh, idea makers, change makers were in town, uh, people from 48 different countries coming to Miami Beach, which is a wonderful place to visit in March, but also a wonderful place to think about how to solve the great problems of the world. And our city couldn't be a better place to do it uh, as a uh, barrier island sitting at ground level made of porous limestone. We see climate change as much as anyone. So I'm excited because in March we're going to have uh, the third annual uh, Aspen Ideas Climate here in the city. And I want you all to know that even, uh, I won't be the mayor after that, but uh, we intend on having this in this city uh, for as long as we are facing and until we solve the climate challenge, yeah. because that is a challenge that is not going away. And I think that what we have done is created an ability to bring people together to talk not just about the problem, but more importantly, how to solve it. My own city has been using things we, a couple of years ago, you talked to us, and we had someone talking about the reef line. Uh, my, my residents just funded. The reef line was somebody's idea. It was an underwater museum that helps the reef, but also provides ecotourism ideas. Sounded crazy two or three years ago. My residents funded it last year in November for $5 million. So we're going to have exactly an idea that was percolating here in Aspen Ideas. So things that people talk about here mean something. And... Uh, and we, and I think my city is very happy and privileged to have you here uh, in the future. So, ladies and gentlemen, Dan Porterfield. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Gelber. Thank you to uh, Michelle Berger, uh, the whole city of Miami Beach, the greater met uh, Miami metropolitan area. Um, scares me a little bit that the mayor walked off stage. I don't know what that means. Uh, uh, he. I'm going, to, I'm going to say something at the end about your leadership. Uh, uh, we're, we're quite proud of what we, the ASP Institute, with our different programs and departments, and you, the community of Miami Beach, have created together. It's, it's important. It's making a difference. And um, it's really convening around this question of what do we, how do we address something as enormous as the climate crisis in a way that is creative and solutions oriented. And as I've had the pleasure of being your partner during these last two years, and it, I've changed my own thinking a little bit about the climate issues in this sense, that there was a time when I was thinking, well, there's probably four or five big, big solutions. And we just got to get speed and scale on those four or five things. And from being in this community, I really believe that there, while there may be four or five very important solutions, there's really thousands of them that are needed because every single person
has something to offer and something to give. And in fact, if we sort of sit back and say, well, the governments and the big companies and the big sectors, they're the ones that are going to take care of it all, we won't have the public will for the changes that are doable and are sizable but are, but are achievable. And that sense of a public spirit, a public will for protecting our environment, for protecting vulnerable people and vulnerable communities, for generating new economic opportunities that then actually offer futures to all kinds of communities and individuals that maybe have been closed out on economic opportunity thus far um, is really exciting. And I think what Miami has brought and Miami Beach has brought is this sort of spirit and culture and can-do attitude um, that is critical to make addressing the climate crisis not only an imperative, but actually an act of community joy. Um, and it's one of the things about this experience of partnering uh, in Miami Beach with this community and bringing national and global leaders to Miami Beach is that we're at, of course, one of the epicenters of the climate crisis, as, as Mayor Gelber said, but we're also at a place that is not sitting back and saying, well, I hope the people that go to COP can help solve our problem. Um, quite the opposite. Really exciting to see the way business, um, educators, community leaders, uh, public health leaders, housing leaders, um, local government and its different manifestations uh, are teaming up and making it work. I, I want to add actually the media. The Miami Herald has been amazing in the way you've grown the coverage uh, of the issues and, and helped to set a standard really for the, for the industry, uh, for journalism about how to think about covering climate issues in a way that is not fatalistic. Um, so it's pretty amazing to be here. Um, this panel is going to be extra special with David Martin from the Terror Group, Alexis Pelosi from the U.S. Department of Housing, and thank you for coming down, um, and Urban Development, uh, Josh Sawazlak from Deloitte, thank you Josh, also another one coming from D.C., um, Destiny Smith from Catalyst Miami, and of course uh, Alex Harris for moderating. Um, I think you know this, but the Aspen Institute is a global nonprofit organization. We've been around for 75 years since the aftermath of the Holocaust when business leaders and thinkers came together and said, what can we do to protect civilization so that we don't have global war, nuclear devastation, a uh, Soviet system expanding and expanding? What can we do to um, protect human dignity? Human dignity on, uh, under siege again as we know, around the world. For those of you that have family and friends in the Middle East, loved ones, I know what a terrible time this is, um, and I wish the best on behalf of the ASP Institute, where we're actually working in the Middle East and in Israel uh, and in, in Palestine. I wish the best for you and your families. Um, so for 75 years, we've been trying to bring people together for the dialogue that's practical and productive that leads to understanding new possibilities and solutions. And Aspen Ideas Climate has been almost like the, the perfect example of the Aspen method, where you have big main stage convening with Kamala Harris or Gloria Estefan or uh, Bill Nye or Nancy Pelosi you know, speaking, and then you have all these breakout sessions digging in about uh, new technologies, new ways of financing innovation, new ways of involving the community, new ways of protecting uh, the mangroves, the reefs. Um, and that spirit is really what the Institute is about. And I, again, I thank you for allowing us to renew ourselves, in a sense, by working here in this new way. This coming year, we're going to have all these future leaders coming together. We had, I think it was 250 last year, um, with a couple thousand applications. That's growing. Uh, we think we'll be somewhere north of 3,000, maybe 3,500 participants. That's been growing every year. Um, a lot of investment comes to the individual uh, innovators that come and present what they're doing. We at the ASP Institute uh, showcased some of our work, and the State Department asked us at the end of last year's summit to submit a proposal to be the coordinating body for a global effort to um, remove plastics from the ocean. And so that was just one way that we ourselves have been able to grow our work because of this convening. So the planning is underway. We already know that we have uh, climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe and the White House's first national climate advisor, Gina McCarthy, who will be here. But you know, plenty more announcements will come out in the weeks and months ahead. 
Um, we're probably going to have more breakout sessions um, and you know, an even bigger summit. I was pretty excited that there were employers that were here last year looking to have a sort of an expo to, uh, to identify candidates to come work in a whole wide range of businesses uh, in this space. That also is another, I think, I hope feature of what you'll see developing uh, in this year's summit. Um, lots of NGO leaders are coming, CEOs, uh, political people will be coming, but it's all about solutions. And um, as I say, thank you to welcoming us with such open arms. I do want to take another moment to say something about uh, Mayor Gelber uh, and Michelle Berger. And uh, we did become friends playing basketball together. Uh, you, you were the DC version of, of D. Wade, of Dwayne Wade, uh, D. Gelber. Uh, uh, and he's got a, he's got an all around game. His reputation is that he shoots a lot and talks trash, but he actually plays defense and passes and is a good teammate uh, and a pretty fierce competitor. And I've always enjoyed over the years since we met seeing your work in the public space. Um, and I would, would just like to say for, on behalf of the ASP Institute uh, to Dan and to Michelle, thank you so much for serving, for sacrificing, and for leading for this community in a way that has brought the country to Miami Beach to learn more about the community and to address the climate crisis so well. And I know you address a lot of other issues from housing to crime uh, to economic development uh, and public health and more. Um, I wish every political leader and every chief of staff were so committed to the public good the way you two are, because if we had that writ large across the country, we would have even more progress coming even faster. Um, it's an <laughs> if the Aspen Institute had a key, a key to the Institute, we'd be giving it to the two of you. I know you're passing out keys to the city uh, every now and then. We would be passing it on to you and saying uh, we are definitely counting on you to stay close to this effort as we prepare after this year for Aspen Ideas Climate 4.0 and 5.0 and 6.0 here in Miami Beach. A lot of interest around the country for more Ideas Climate since the way we're thinking about it is this will always be the central one and then we'll sort of spin off smaller ones at different times of the year. So you can almost imagine a series of four or five Aspen Ideas Climates with Miami Beach being the founder uh, and the foundation of it all. So on that note, um, let me again thank all of you for being here, thank my colleagues for the ASP Institute, and welcome uh, Alexis Pelosi, who is Senior Advisor for Climate in the Office of the Secretary of the uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to the podium. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of Secretary Marsha Fudge, I'm honored to be here today representing the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development at this preview event to next April's third annual Aspen Ideas Climate Event, The Future of Climate Resilient Housing. I want to thank the Aspen Institute and Mayor Gelber of Miami Beach for the invitation and for the opportunity to provide some opening remarks today. As a federal agency dedicated to creating strong, sustainable, inclusive communities and quality, affordable homes for all, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development is on the front lines of the nation's efforts to tackle the climate crisis, build resilient communities, and address environmental injustice. At HUD, we understand the ongoing threat presented by climate change because climate change is hurting the people we serve. From severe storms and flooding to wildfires, droughts, and extreme heat and cold, Americans are already facing its effect, especially those most vulnerable. We know that climate impacts and associated natural disasters disproportionately harm low-income communities and communities of color who already suffer the burdens of disinvestment and historic discrimination. These communities are less able to prepare for, respond to, and recover from the impacts of climate change and natural disasters. Building resilient communities that can withstand more intense natural disasters is critical to the future health of our nation. HUD, through its Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery and Mitigation Funds, is one of the federal government's largest investments in disaster recovery and resilience in low to moderate income communities. Over the past few years, HUD is transforming traditional disaster recovery by investing in adaptation and resilience planning and by ensuring that climate justice and racial equity are central to recovery and resilience. 
By incorporating resilience planning into recovery activities, grantees can strengthen their community's resilience to future climate impacts. Responding to the climate crisis and historical and ongoing environmental injustice is not an ancillary responsibility of the department. It is central to HUD's core mission. It is embedded in goal four of our strategic plan, advancing sustainable communities, and reflected in our robust climate action plan. HUD is working to advance increased energy efficiency in HUD-supported housing through updated notices, incentives, technical assistance, and supporting to investing in energy and water efficiency, including community solar, providing cost savings, cleaner air, and greenhouse gas mitigation. HUD has awarded grants that incentivize or require green and resilient building approaches and building decarbonization in HUD-supported housing, making this housing safer and cleaner and so much more. When we think about the event next April and the topic of the future of resilient housing, it is critical to remember the moment we are in as well as the tremendous potential opportunities ahead. As of October 10th, there have been 24 confirmed weather climate disaster events with losses exceeding $1 billion each. In 2022 in the United States, more than 3 million adults were forced to evacuate their homes because of a natural disaster, and 16 percent, or 480,000 of those adults, never returned to their home. This loss of housing highlights the need to invest in resilience, adaptation, and sustainability, because affordable housing is more than just the cost of rent. It is a home that can withstand the next storm or storms, and one that weathers our uncertain climate future. And there is hope. In August 2022, President Biden signed into law the largest climate bill in the history of the United States. The Inflation Reduction Act is a once-in-a-generation investment in climate resilience and sustainability. Over the next decade, this investment will provide billions of dollars for green building efficiency upgrades, solar generation, and other clean energy deployment, green workforce development training, financing tools, and more. The programs being established under it and the investments to be made will be transformative. They will reduce energy costs and support resiliency, reducing the likelihood of catastrophic damage from future disasters. They will help preserve tens of thousands of affordable homes by making them more efficient, healthier, and resilient. These investments in efficiency, electrification, and renewable measures don't just reduce utility consumption costs and emissions. They make properties more resilient to extreme weather events while keeping residents safer and healthier. There are investments also being made across the federal government in research development specifically targeted towards affordable housing and resilient housing. Take, for example, last week, the Department of Energy um, announced their eighth and final affordable home energy earth shot, seeking to accelerate breakthrough research and development, advancing scalable technologies and installation solutions, including building upgrades, efficient electrification, and smart controls with the goal of reducing America's energy bills by 20% while reducing the cost of decarbonizing new and existing housing by 50% within the decade. There are also new financing tools being created, like EPA's historic $27 billion Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Funded under IRA, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund aims to mobilize private capital to deliver lower energy costs and economic revitalization to communities that have historically been left behind. And don't even get me started on the tax credits and the tremendous opportunity they create to invest in renewable energy in low-income communities and properties and the opportunity for non-taxable entities to recoup those credits directly through elective or direct pay. Agencies across the board receive significant funding. HUD received approximately $1 billion for its Green and Resilient Retrofit Program to improve the housing quality and resilience of certain existing HUD-assisted multifamily properties. Across the federal government, agencies are coming together in ways they have not in the past. We are working to eliminate barriers and to increase collaboration to ensure investments being made will benefit the people and communities historically disadvantaged and most at risk from climate impacts. But it is more than just program design. Coordinated and collaborative outreach and engagement, including technical assistance, will be key to successful implementation of these, success of these historic funds. And from the beginning, this has been occurring. The Biden-Harris administration has established one-stop locations where information on available resources can be found. Agencies have been developing joint technical assistance and participating in stakeholder events across topic areas, ensuring information about funding opportunities are shared widely to multiple audiences. HUD specifically has been thinking from the beginning on how to support getting the technology and financial investments 
from the lab to the home. HUD has developed a library of resources for HUD program participants and the American public to understand how best to take advantage of the once in a generation investments in decarbonization and climate resilience. We have created a navigator to help program participants sort funding opportunities across agencies. We released a climate resources and housing supply framework describing how climate funding can be used to fill gaps in new housing construction. And as part of our Build for the Future initiative, we are beginning regional engagements to increase awareness of the tremendous opportunities before us. To wrap things up, since day one, the Biden-Harris administration has advanced the most ambitious climate agenda in history, leading a whole of government approach to climate resilience, focusing on reducing emissions across every sector of the economy, including the building sector, and expanding affordable clean energy to every American. But as the nation drives toward clean energy and a carbon-free future, we need to make sure that low-income and historically disadvantaged communities are not left behind. HUD is working to ensure that they will be part of the transformation, sharing in the economic and health benefits these investments provide. And it is on all of us to ensure that our nation's most affordable homes are among our nation's most efficient, safe, and healthy homes. So as we start this panel and preview the event next spring and think about the future of climate resilient housing, we should think about how we build, sustain, and support housing that is future proof. Housing that focuses on and prioritizes sustainable communities, puts people first, promotes environmental justice, and recognizes housing's role as essential to health. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion, and I'll turn it over. Thanks so much. Hi, folks. Thanks so much for being here today. I think this is a really important discussion, and I'm so glad you're here to join us. Uh, my name is Alex Harris. I'm the lead climate reporter for the Miami Herald. We have a team that tackles the issues of how climate change is affecting our community and how we are or aren't responding. And we have a great lineup today. And before I let our panelists briefly introduce themselves, I just wanted to kind of give an intro of why we're talking about housing. I think Alexis gave us a really great <laughs> intro into a lot of the things I was going to bring up, so I will keep it very brief. But I think housing is the most intersectional of all climate topics, and I'm sure you all agree. We need our homes to keep us cool when it gets increasingly hot outside. We need them to keep us safe from hurricanes. We need them to keep us safe from wildfires. And the energy we use to power them and keep us cool and safe inside needs to come from clean resources. So there's so many different aspects of the climate crisis that all come together when we think about housing, and we need that housing to be affordable to everyone, not just the wealthy. So all of these solutions that we're gonna be talking about today and all these problems, we need to come at them from a multi-step process that helps everyone and lifts all boats and not just some. So I'm gonna go ahead and let our panel introduce themselves. Um, and just to let you guys know, we are gonna save some time at the end for questions. So if you've got some burning questions or it brings up really cool ideas, please feel free to uh, hold them and I'll, we'll let you know and we'll get there to the end. So go ahead with. Yep. So David Martin, I'm the CEO of Terra. Uh, was born here uh, in Miami uh, 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 from uh, two Cuban parents that migrated here in the early '60s, and uh, and I've been uh, our company's developing uh, in all over South Florida, Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach, and uh, I've been actively involved in certain initiatives, uh, from being on some sea level rise committees for certain municipalities, or also being on the uh, Biscayne Bay Task Force. Uh, and also developing in a lot of neighborhoods, thinking about how to plan neighborhoods uh, uh, to have uh, to really be sustainable and, and really complete. Uh, so, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Destiny Smith. I am the leadership program manager with Catalyst Miami, and we are a nonprofit that works with communities to address our immediate needs and also build a better future together like something that we're having conversation around today. Um, and so we do anywhere from direct services for folks that are interested in getting healthcare insurance or teaching folks around what does it mean um, to be a healthcare advocate and how do we get affordable healthcare for all folks. And I think even health and climate are really intricately related here in Miami as we're considering extreme heat, as we're considering um, you know, air pollution and things of that nature as well. So yeah, I'm really excited for the conversation, environmental justice and racial justice advocate. So I'm really excited to be um, in the room with you all. Well, I'm Josh Soslack. Uh, I'm a managing director at Deloitte Consulting. We're a big professional services firm. Um, I also hold an appointment uh, as a professional affiliate um, of the Center for Urban and Environmental Solutions at FAU. Um, 
And I am so excited to be here to talk about this today because the intersection of climate and housing is so critical. Because think about it, where do we spend most of our lives? In our houses. And that's the thing we have to, to protect for people because it will push out into everything else we do. And I'm Alexis Pelosi. I'm the Senior Advisor for Climate in the Office of the Secretary at HUD. And so in my role, I oversee the agency's climate portfolio. And then as you probably gathered a little bit from our remarks, um, I've spent a lot of time over the past year really focused on the Inflation Reduction Act and what it means to you know, work with other agencies to help and get those investments into housing and in particular into affordable housing. Got you. So to kick things off, I think I'm going to talk about when most of us think about housing and climate our brains go to building codes, right? South Florida is a world leader in building really strong storm resistant homes after Hurricane Andrew hit here in 1992. And we've exported those to most of the state and in some places, different corners of the world. Uh, we have really come super far in making sure that we are able to withstand the very strong winds that climate change may bring. But when it comes to flood, heat, all the other aspects of it, maybe we have some more ways to go. So I wanted to ask Josh, if you think that we are accelerating at the right pace, do you think that we need to keep the energy going, we need to spread around the world, where do you think we need to be in building codes? We, we absolutely need to keep pushing forward on building code. And I will tell you, one of the jobs that I had amongst many that I've done in my uh, long career is I was the infrastructure lead for President Obama's Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force uh, in the New York region. And we did a big report. Um, and one of the things that, uh, one of the main recommendations of that report was that communities adopt and enforce current building code because so many communities have outdated building code. And so I think being on the forefront of that is so important because it sets a baseline. It says everybody deserves this level of protection. And it enforces it uniformly. It makes sure that this is not something that rich people get and poor people don't get. Um, and we not only have to do that, and then we have to incentivize people. And what I will say is there are some examples of that being done um, uh, in, <clears throat> excuse me, South Carolina, the legislature actually mandated that if you build to a certain standard, you will get a discount on your insurance. Um, and working with um, a group called the Inst uh, Institute for Building and Home Safety, um, they actually uh, adopted a standard that builders could build to. And look, insurance is a huge challenge, especially in Florida. But we have to start looking at this holistically. And we have to move forward and really ensure that all of the um, properties that we're building and that we're retrofitting are to a standard that will be resilient. Absolutely. And let's think about how that looks right now in the present. Sometimes you can look at those building codes and you can either meet them to the letter and end up with your nice square white box. Sometimes you can look at them a little more creatively and you can think about how to tilt them to create something that actually kind of aids the community around it. So I was, David, I was wondering if you could talk about your Canopy Park project as an example of, you know, how to be a little bit more creative and maybe even rise above some of those building codes. Great. And, uh, you know, I think uh, when we're thinking about housing, um, you know, we have to like, look at housing in, in all different spectrums. Uh, you know, certain housing that is for the upper high end, um, uh, the upper income, uh, should have a responsibility to kind of give back to the community a little more, right? And so in this project, uh, it's a kind of a, a, a significant project. We're doing, we bought around six acres. It was a surface parking lot of an old abandoned uh, hospital. And, uh, and we were able to work with the community and uh, build around 230 residences, probably around a billion dollars of uh, value. Uh, the real estate you know, taxes that are gonna be coming from that are gonna be significant, probably in the range of 20 million a year. So hopefully that's funding a lot of quality of life and services. And, and the site actually had the ability to build 1,000 units um, and, and we just built around 230. So uh, with that project, we realized that the community, there was a big void in the community. First of all, West Avenue has been going through um, uh, some history and frustration and anxiety as it relates to how to solve flooding and how to raise their roads and how to deal with harmonization. Uh, in our case, uh, we were able to, instead of uh, using all those six acres for development, we actually created a very uh, resilient park uh, uh, that's called Canopy Park that basically um, ha uh, has uh, around 12 wells underground that are cleaning the water uh, uh, for the entire South Beach Basin, the stormwater system, prior to it going into a pump station and going into the bay. 
uh, our bays, something that we're uh, protecting so much. Um, and, uh, and it's very important. And we've been seeing a lot of nutrient overload in our bay. And so we've been seeing some of our seagrass die off. And, and this is not good. And it's a very important for tourism, economic viability, our environmental sustainability. So, so many reasons it's important. But so this project's park is actually helping clean the bay. Right, and that's something nice and interesting. We also used uh, certain cisterns and certain bioswales and, and a lot of ideas to kind of pilot new ways of thinking whenever we're creating green infrastructure and inside the community. So uh, today the, build, the project got built uh, and, uh, and that was kind of one example uh, of, uh, of some environmental solutions. And then from a pedestrian mobility point of view, we also are building a pedestrian bridge uh, for the city. Uh, that's going to be connecting and creating a, a nice amenity for the neighborhood. So I think overall development should be used to, or looked at, in my opinion, as, as a problem solver for neighborhood issues uh, rather than uh, always as creating impact. So thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we want to see more of these kinds of projects, right? We want to see more that take into account the impact that they already have on the neighborhood around them and maybe the ways that they could be used a little bit more creatively to solve for flooding, create safer and more affordable housing. But oftentimes the biggest stumbling point to that is money. So Alexis, I was hoping you could talk about the ways that the Biden administration has made a lot more of that available in the way of creating more you know, affordable and also workforce housing that's more climate resilient. A uh, great question um, and also my favorite topic. So I love to talk about all of the funding that is out there and is available uh, for communities and property owners uh, to take advantage of to help and to support housing. And so again, the Inflation Reduction Act was just a tremendous investment um, in climate and in the future of this country. And so when we look across all of the different agencies, there are multiple different pots of money that can be used to help and support uh, new housing construction. I mentioned uh, that HUD had just put out something called called Climate Resources for Housing Supply. It's a very high level document. It's about seven pages and it goes over just some of the key opportunities that exist and how you could layer and braid those resources to build not only green and energy efficient and sustainable housing, but also to build housing because we are not only in a climate crisis, but we are also in a housing crisis. And, you know, when folks think about housing and they think about housing construction, they often come to HUD as you would um, as the Agency of Housing and Urban Development. Our funds are tremendous investments in communities across this country. There are billions and billions of dollars in other federal agencies that can be used and layer and braided with HUD funds, um, with existing funds in the community to help and make these investments. And so, you know, I would point people to looking at the resources that we've created online, also at the White House, um, that go over the different funding opportunities. And I'm happy to answer any specific questions, but I would say that there is a lot of money that is out there now that will also be coming down. The other thing I think that we hear a lot about is, well, I've missed the opportunity or there's too much out there. I just can't quite understand what it is. Folks should know that large portions of the money, like the rebates that are coming down from the Department of Energy, there has been um, an opportunity put on the street for state energy offices to craft plans, to then submit back to the Department of Energy, to then set up how the rebates will be allocated. The good news is 40% of those need to go to low income and disadvantaged communities. 10% is set aside for multifamily properties, which is amazing. The Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, the notice of funding opportunity for that, again, $27 billion broken out into three pots, just closed on October 13th. Eventually that will be awarded and then those funds will be out on the street to provide low uh, cost financing, hopefully, fingers triple crossed, um, for affordable housing um, and other types of investments. And so there is a lot of money, it is coming. Um, don't feel as though you've missed the opportunity. Keep the, your eye out and look for more information coming from across the federal family about how to be able to access and utilize those funds. And even not just the giant uh, sweeps of money coming from the Biden administration, even after a hurricane, uh, HUD is one of the number one sources of money to rebuild both homes, businesses, small business association grants. FEMA, everyone thinks of FEMA, they're there first with the money, but when it comes to rebuilding, if you don't know this in Florida and any other state, most of that money does come from HUD and it comes with policies and standards that demand that the buildings that we rebuild are to the highest building codes. 
uh, Alexis, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, how are, is, are you developing new policies to sort of adapt um, to make sure that the, what we build back is stronger? Yes. So when you talked about our disaster recovery portfolio, um, in 2022, we issued a new consolidated notice, which is basically the notice that goes out for how, when you receive an allocation from the federal government for that long-term disaster recovery after a Stafford Act, you know, declaration of a disaster, um, the different requirements around that. And as part of that consolidated notice, there is a requirement, like I talked about in remarks, 15% of all the funds need to be focused on adaptation and mitigation. There are also higher building standards associated. So when you use those funds for building, you need to build to a higher and a more resilient standard. I talked a little bit about our greenhouse or uh, green and resilient retrofit program um, that is out there on the streets to support retrofits of multifamily properties. When you make those investments and you're utilizing uh, HUD funds, you need to be building to a higher and more resilient standard. So across all of our policies, when we are putting out competitive um, funding opportunities, we are, as part of those, also requiring, right, that you meet a higher, more resilient building standard. Uh, HUD is also in the process of completing our floodplain uh, rules, which is something that is required by statute, um, as well as updating with the Department of Agriculture our energy code requirements. Again, something that we're required to do by statute. And looking across our program areas for ways that we can look more creatively at the opportunities where our funding is being used to help communities think about and build more resilient. And then just quickly, I know I talk a lot. Um, you know, HUD has just robust technical assistance. And so because a lot of our funds go out through block grants, which means that you as a community, if you qualify for them, there's a formula and you receive the funds, you need to submit um, a consolidated plan and an annual plan or planning to the agency. But ultimately, as we all know, these decisions are local, right? And the solutions need to be local and they need to be based on what the community needs and what the community wants. HUD though does provide information Information to help and encourage communities to make those investments in a resilient manner. We have a number of climate resilience toolkits, we have implementation guides, and we are just continuing to build out and provide you know, robust technical assistance to help and support our grantees when they're starting to think about and look at how to invest federal funds to invest them in a resilient way. And to hone in on what you said about community building, I mean, yes, that's great to know that there's financial resources, that there's planning resources, tactical resources, all these great new ideas of how we can build our communities. But I think the essential question is always to think, who are we building these communities for and who is going to live in them? And I think, Destiny, maybe you can talk a little bit about the importance of giving community members a seat at the table when it comes to planning what the future of our cities are going to look like in our homes. Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, as we just discussed we talked a lot about affordable housing. We've talked a lot about all the funding that's coming in. Um, and what does that even really mean to community, right? And so when we think about the, even the definitions of affordability, what does that really look like for community? Is it actually affordable? Um, is that actually something that is benefiting our community based on the standards that who got to set, right? And so when we really think about the definitions of affordable housing, when we think about who is at the table making those decisions, oftentimes it's not people that look like me and my community. And so I think it is so important that community members are not at the table at the very end of the process getting letters around how it is that we uh, fight an eviction when it comes or getting letters around what it is that we can do um, to, to move back into our homes possibly um, once we are displaced, but it really is having a seat at the table um, to determine what our housing should look like. We have the solutions. When you think about Overtown, for example, um, back in the day, they used to be called shotgun houses. Actually, they're called shogun houses, right? And so, But the narrative was always that, oh, it was because they were designed in a way that a shotgun could go from the front to the back. Actually, no, it came through deep knowledge and ancestral wisdom from Africa where they built these homes in a specific way that was actually resilient for storms and to weather the storms in the Caribbean and in other islands. And so they brought that wisdom to then build these homes, right, which were then torn down and the rest is history. Um, but without that important knowledge and that knowledge from the people that are living in this community, we continue to make solutions that do not benefit our community members. And so having folks at the table to make those decisions, to be able to dictate and to, to give honor to um, our cultural and our, our, our legacy, um, to give honor to what it is that we best need and we're the people that know how 
that is, right? When you go into your you go into your house, if someone was to come and say, well, we're just going to paint the wall this color and we're going to actually change this whole thing around and you're going to love it, right? You probably have a little bit of issues with that, right? You probably have some issues. And so I think it is so important that as we're designing, as we're developing, as we're retrofitting, right? Because there are people that are living in homes today that still need a lot of these same sorts of funding to rebuild and to make their homes more climate resilient too. And so those are things that are still present that I think are so important to be at the forefront of the conversation. Um, and so again, not having community members at the end of the tail end of the process, um, but really being intentional around gaining that wisdom and understanding for what it is that actually benefits the community. How are they going to be able to, how are we going to be able to um, actually take action on a lot of these solutions that you've mentioned earlier? Um, we talked about community joy earlier and like getting this public kind of joy to come together, this public will. And that really does take involving community at the very forefront of the process so that way we can all work on these solutions together. It's a mindset, sh mindset shift, right? To think of your community as another expert that needs to sit at your table. Like Destiny just said, you can build the most beautiful, smart house that's the best protected in the whole world, but if it doesn't actually meet the needs of the people, then what did you build? And something I found really interesting in South Florida through my reporting is when you talk to people in the community about what kinds of climate solutions they're looking for, really often what we hear is people want nature-based solutions. They want their communities protected and greened by mangroves, by coral reefs, not 20-foot steel walls. There's a lot of conversation about, you know, they want to live in harmony with their neighborhood. They want to see nature, you know, as nature is threatening them, they want nature to protect them. And that was really something that I think, you know, if you come just from a ROI perspective, that's maybe not the answer you reach, but if you talk to the community and ask what they want and what they want their world to look like, it's a little bit greener. So Josh, can you talk about how, you know, around the world, it seems like green and blue solutions, nature-based, have sort of won out in community conversations around gray solutions? Absolutely, um, but you gave me a mic, so I'm gonna just take a little bit of privilege and, <laughs> and expand upon something that, that Destiny said. <clears throat> when we think about communities and we think about housing, we have to think beyond the house because it's not just the physical structure of the house, right? It's how do you get to work? How do you get to healthcare, to groceries? What are the social um, issues that you need? Childcare, um, your you know, houses of worship, all of these things are tied together. And so when we start to think about how we make communities more resilient, we have to look at the community holistically. Um, and part of that ties back to what Alex was asking about, about this kind of nature-based solutions. And what we're really talking about is why do we live here, right? I mean, this is an incredibly beautiful place. Florida has massive amounts of, of just, you know, nature and, and beauty, and people live here because they want to be close to that. They want to experience that. And if we take that away, if we say, okay, well, we're just gonna, you know, um, cut off Miami from the ocean, why would you wanna be here? Um, it won't work anyway because of the karst and what Dan was talking about and, you know, limestone. So don't worry, the big wall won't actually work. We can't do the Netherlands. Um, but what we have to do is think about it in a sense of what are the types of things? So it's not green or gray, it's green and gray, right? We're gonna need both. Um, Coral reefs are amazing, and we've seen the use of things like uh, oyster beds. In New York, one of the things that they did is they planted a, um, a million oysters, um, uh, created these oyster beds off of um, Staten Island. And what it does is it takes the energy out of some of the storm surge. What it doesn't solve is sea level rise, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a solution, but it's not a panacea. You can't just say, oh, we're just going to put in an artificial reef, and that's going to solve our sea level rise problem, because it won't. You have to look at these things. You have to understand the problem and then think about what the solution is that fixes that problem. But as you're doing that, think holistically about how do you protect the integrity of the community, not just the physical piece, because infrastructure is only there to serve people. Right, and that's why you don't want to end up with a bunch of houses on stilts that you have to take boats to get to, right? You still want to be able to reach your house of worship, take your kids to soccer practice in a 
field that's not under salt water. Uh, you want to be able to live your life and you want to build a community that is resilient about more than just perfect steel houses, right? Uh, and sometimes maybe that makes nature's best uh, effort is a buffer zone, right? We want to put all that nature in front of us to keep us safe. Sometimes maybe we need a little bit more nature. And that means maybe we need to move away from the areas that are most at risk. Some people call it retreat. Some people call it managed relocation. Some people call it, you know, creating buffer zones. There's a lot of words for it. But when we think about, you know, how we want to live in the future, we also think about where we need to live. Do we need to pack as many people as possible onto the thinnest barrier islands? Maybe not. So I'm curious about, David, how developers in Miami think about it when constantly you're hearing experts from New York and elsewhere saying, why do you live in Miami? Why are you building new buildings in Miami Beach? How do you think about retreat? Is it a now problem, a 50 years from now problem, or a never problem? I think it's it's a now problem, and it's been a problem for a while, I think. Uh, and I would use the word reorganization rather than re re relocation or retreat. Um, but, I, but I think, uh, you know, when we th look back at how the these comprehensive plans were created uh, with the Florida Growth Management Act and and how cities and municipalities, the data and information they had when they were planning where to allocate density, where to allocate uses, uh, I, I don't think they have the level of technology or information they have now. And with LIDAR te technology, for instance, we could really study the hydrology of neighborhoods to really understand where, what type of built environment we want to create throughout our neighborhoods. And I think the way we're looking at it is more on a neighborhood scale, right, and finding neighborhood solutions because every kind of neighborhood is different, right? Certain pockets of Miami Beach are low. Certain pockets of Miami Beach are high. Uh, certain pockets have a lot of green space and, and abilities for water squares and stuff like that. Some don't. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's, um, it's a huge challenge. You know, I think this is... Um, this is not easy. This is really, uh, you know, kind of city making, city creation, kind of probably 90% of the built environment is there. It's probably not going to change. We're going to need to retrofit. We're going to need to think of how uh, buildings can store water, right? Uh, private property can store water. We only have a certain amount of public land available to us. Uh, and we need to start thinking of, of incentives, right? Uh, and I think, um, you know, looking at our land use policies, uh, to try to incentivize affordable housing, to try to look at ways of creating supply. But the problem is the supply sometimes we're creating is is expensive supply to build. Uh, construction materials, construction costs are so high right now. Um, and uh, obviously interest rates are, are very high right now. So, so we have a, a very complicated uh, uh, situation uh, where uh, the typology, you know, when we think of community and start listening to community and, and we start seeing everything we're building and designing and then saying, well, does the community really want to live in a 20 story building or would they want to really live in a row house? And, and so, and today our zoning code is somewhat very restrictive as it relates to being able to densify in it, you know, and create more you know, row houses or townhouses or courtyard buildings or, or little low-rise, mid-rise buildings, right? So we need, we need to think about, um, you know, when we're looking at these neighborhood strategies and looking at reorganizing and, and really seeing how we're going to manage water, we need to be thinking about the type of housing we're creating. Uh, if you look at Dade County and you look at the density per acre in Brickell and the density per acre in Little Havana, Little Havana has a higher density per acre. And I could show you the studies, uh, but it's really with a lot of lower scale buildings uh, with more density and, and sometimes creates a better environment. And at the end of the day, what we see in South Florida and Miami and all these neighborhoods, they're all creating their own DNA, their own kind of identity and personality, and which is really exciting. You know, I think it's really exciting and, and, uh, and you know, really looking forward to you know, uh, trying to build equity in with the existing businesses and the existing residents, um, you know, is really important, right? So, you know, when, you know, kind of, you know, our firm is really studying and thinking of, you know, how to create gentrification protection ideas or anti-gentrification toolkits, um, whether it goes from cradle to career strategies for the, for, the, for the community, but also kind of in what we're building and how we're building and where we're building it and, and, and really seeing how we could get more resources to improve the infrastructure for neighborhoods that are underinvested. So I think every neighborhood has a different solution and we're just creating a different plan for each one. Absolutely. I think one size fit all, we all know down here in Florida that does not work. I mean, we can't build the same walls that the Dutch can build, karst geology, 
kind of doesn't help us there. But I, I, when we think about, I think the best example of what does reorganization look like in Florida might be the Keys right now, because the Florida Keys did a, an analysis of all of their land, and they said, okay, here are the places that make the most sense for us to invest in. Let's do more investment. Let's create more density. Let's double down on making sure we've got the sewage lines and the water and the business and the affordable housing. But there are also certain islands and certain roads that maybe we shouldn't be investing in. Maybe those are areas that will not be here in the future. Maybe those are areas that living will be much more difficult in, in the future and we have limited public dollars. Let's decide how to use them more intelligently. So if we're to apply that same framework back here in Miami-Dade County and think about what neighborhoods should we be investing in, what ones are gonna be a little different, we end up with a slightly different situation than the Keys because if you look at our traditionally high elevation areas here, that little sort of coral ridge that goes down the middle of the county, those are traditionally black and brown communities that ended up there because of racist redlining practices that have been reinforced by decades of racist practices. So when you talk about, oh, that's easy, we'll just build density in high elevation areas and we'll move away from low areas, that has a equity and racial component to it. So when we talk about climate gentrification, which is the topic you brought up here, Destiny, I wanna talk about how you know, we move forward. How do we make those smart decisions that we need to and develop this community in a safe, forward-looking way without exploiting people and kicking them out of the land they've lived in for a long time and maybe forcing them to live somewhere that's less safe? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, I think definitions are so important, right? And so when we think about climate gentrification, what does that even mean? It really is all of the solutions that we've just talked about, this greening, wanting to become more resilient, um, and it's taken an absence of community, right? We're taking it an absence of community voice, community's needs, um, and instead we are focusing more on what is going to be the most resilient for me and my family and for the folks that are on the beach currently, right? Like that's what we're thinking. But we're taking it in absence of the folks that are most vulnerable and that then creates a complete displacement. And so in Miami, as you shared, Alex, um, the most high elevation is in Little Haiti and Overtown, Liberty City, right? And so those are all the areas that were redlined, right, and are still to this day continuing to struggle under the practices of redlining, um, even still to this day. This is 2023, right? Um, and so as we're thinking through that, as we're knowing that folks are going to have to start moving more inland, and we're seeing it already, um, what does it look like for us to create a space where we're leaning into community wisdom, we're offering up community-driven solutions, um, and not only just community-driven solutions, but what does community ownership look like, right? As we're thinking about community developers, are we also developing folks in the community to develop their own communities, right? We have a lot of funding and a lot of resources for folks that are may not look like me to go and to get degrees and architecture and all of these things to be able to completely revitalize a community. But what is it like for someone like me who's lived in this community, right, to then determine what that looks like and be able to support the community around me and have all of their thoughts and ideas included into that process. And so I think it really looks like community ownership. Um, Miami-Dade County also just passed um, kind of this trial for community land trusts. And so what is it like for us to get more community land trusts and more community owned based owner solutions um, when we're thinking about how it is that we can um, limit climate gentrification and all of that? I think we do have to take into consideration um, just the historical practices, but also too, I think we do have to think about as well uh, teaching that, being able to speak that, right? Because what you just shared is a lot of things that we often cannot say here in Florida. And so being able to learn actually what's happening in our communities, how it's impacting us, I think is the first step. Um, not criminalizing or, um, uh, you know, not criminalizing housing insecurity for, for one is also a really big thing as we're thinking about climate gentrification. There are a lot of folks that are, whether here on the beach or um, across the river, that are facing housing insecurity. The latest Alice um, report said that over half a million uh, Miami-Dade County residents are currently in or one emergency away from housing insecurity and from poverty. So that's a lot of us in this room, right? Like one emergency away that we are now facing housing insecurity that would leave us in a position to be on the streets and then, you know, who knows what happens after that, right? And so I think um, really as we're thinking about this, we have to be understanding of um, 
the folks that are at the table, creating more community pathways for community ownership, pathways for community development. Um, and yeah, prison is not a for affordable housing uh, solution. It is just not, right? It's just not an affordable housing solution. So I just wanted to be honest about that and just say that I think it is important for us to um, take that those things into, into consideration. Um, and yeah, I think it's going to also take a lot of divestment from ego, divestment from uh, you know wanting to gain the most profit out of uh, development. Um, we're talking about affordable housing. Really understanding who is affordable for may also mean that you will not make the most bucks from this because the folks that are going to live in it maybe cannot pay the $3,000 that you're wanting to, to see out of that unit. And so are we willing to make those kind of sacrifices and decisions for our, the ha on behalf of our collective good? Um, Dan said earlier about the, you know, uh, said community joy and it's the public will. And I just love that. I thought that was just so powerful for me because I think it is a part of what we all get to do. And if we're going to invest and really limit climate gentrification, it's going to have to be investing in our collective ownership and our collective flourishing as an entire community. Josh, you want to build on that? Yeah. I, look, this is hard. This is the, the, she's absolutely right. And it's hard because it's a policy decision, right? We're, we're not going to say to the private sector, um, build a bunch of affordable housing and don't make any money, because they won't do it, right? They're just not gonna do it. It's not the business that they're in. They will say, fine, we'll go somewhere else and, and do what we do. Um, we have to say to them, let us help you pencil this out. Let us de-risk these projects. Let us invest in these projects. Let us bring, let's make a policy decision around that we want to be supportive of the entire community and that we want a diverse community. Because if you just have rich people, no one's going to park their car, cook their food, clean their house. Like, you need the entire community together. That's what actually functions. And so when we can make that policy decision, then we can start talking about how we do it. But I think we have to build that consensus around this is a positive, good thing. We want to be resilient to climate, and we want the entire community to be resilient to climate. Um, we had a conversation. Um, there's a huge Navy base in, in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. It's the largest Navy base in the world. And the Navy spent a lot of money because it's an important base. Um, making it all resilient for the ships and, you know, aircraft carriers and all the stuff. And they said, well, this is great, and if a big hurricane comes in, then, you know, we're going to send the ships out, and, you know, we're going to tell the sailors all where to go, and this is all great. And we said to them, okay, great, what about the 100,000 civilian employees who support your base? Because if their homes get destroyed, FEMA's going to move them somewhere else. They're going to go where their kids can go to school, and you're not going to be able to operate your base. And they're like, oh, okay, so we have a vested interest in the community. And the Navy started to work with the community and help them build out that, um, that, that resilient approach for the entire community because the civilian community is part of the military community. And we have to look at this region and look at all of the data. It's not just the housing data. It's not just the transportation data. It's not just the land use data. Um, I was up in Broward County this morning kicking off a project with the uh, transportation, the Metropolitan Planning Organization in Broward, where we're going to pull all of the different data sets together and look at it holistically. Because we have to start making decisions that way. And until we can think about it that way, it's not going to work. Because we're getting stovepiped and we're not able to look at the entire community. Yeah, and I just wanted to go off of something that you just said. Um, I think when I think about Miami-Dade County, right, um, we want folks to come work here, but we don't want them to live here. And I mean, that was the same thing that happened back in the day, right, when you had those little ID cards for the beach, right? At one point in time, black people were unable to go to Miami Beach, but, but could only work there. They had to have an ID card in order to go on the beach, right? And so when we're thinking about really what this looks like, it is a policy decision, it is a mindset shift, it is a commitment to really challenging some of the ways in which we've done business, the ways in which we've done life here in Miami, and to be honest about it. Um, and so I think what you're saying is exactly right. Like we do have to um, take these things into an intersectional lens because environmental justice concerns have been happening in Overtown and Liberty City for the longest time, right? And so 
folks, black community here, children are have the highest rates of asthma. And that's also where you, based on where you live, there's several incinerators and there's several um, hazardous waste facilities that are literally go all over Miami-Dade County. And so the folks that are most close to those are black and brown communities. And we are the ones that are suffering under the health impacts of it. You look in Overtown and you see even the tree canopy versus when you go to Coral Gables, there is a difference, right? And so what are we prioritizing? Where are we investing? And how are our policymakers, how are we holding folks accountable to those decisions? Accountable for that, but then also how are, like you said, how are they incentivizing that? How are they also fitting the bill to ensure that that what we truly want to see in our communities is a flourishing is for all people. Because if one group of people is flourish, unflourishing and it's not working, everyone is going to suffer. Just like you said, everyone suffers. It's not economically beneficial for there to be this much insecurity, for there to be this much economic um, uh, just gaps. There's just, it's just not beneficial as a society. And so we have to start making decisions around that that really reflect all people for us to all flourish together. And let's bring it to some of those decisions. David, you've got a project in Overtown. You just, you hinted earlier that you've had some gentrification protections around it. What does that look like from a, a developer trying to build affordable housing? So, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I've met a lot of uh, amazing people uh, from Overtown, uh, amazing uh, business owners, uh, amazing leaders of nonprofits, um, and, uh, and even amazing developers, architects, and 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 just the community outreach was just has been a, a very careful one, but a, a one with a lot of depth and meaning. And and so, for instance, in Overtown, we uh, we engaged Walter Hood uh, from Oakland and uh, and Architect Tonica Geo, and we came up with a uh, a, a landscape uh, enhancement and infrastructure improvement improvement plan for the entire neighborhood. Uh, probably, uh, you know, sitting down with a lot of the elected officials, I'm saying this is a neighborhood that's been underinvested for many, many, many years. And uh, it deserves uh, trees, it deserves lighting, it deserves wayfinding, walkability, and looking for ways to restore the identity uh, from, a, from a streetscape standpoint, naming streets, just really creating a grid and a, and a framework for, for the existing context. And, and it's been uh, it's been been an amazing ride, but it but it's very difficult. Um, you know, when we look at these solutions, we always say, you know, I'm always a big believer in hacking capitalism to 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 solve kind of society's issues. And and it's um, and there's a formula, you know, there's a, there's an income, there's a yield, you know, and 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 uh, and you know, and, and the moment subsidies come in, you know, which are sometimes necessary and good and important, uh, sometimes it delays, you know, the the implementation and and kind of complicates sometimes the execution. So it is a, a very complicated uh, solution. But the big idea with Overtown, I think, it's a transit-oriented community. It's probably it's probably in the, one of the most amazing places. And so for me, how we uh, incentivize existing business owners to stay and flourish. How do we bring new business ideas and concepts that fit a mission and provide tenant assistance? How do we provide tenant assistance for the for the existing residents or discounted rent for the the existing residents that are there? Uh, how do we uh, look at uh, you know ways for you know if values are going to grow? How do, if someone's lived in that community for over ten years? How do we kind of protect or cap their real estate tax? so they it doesn't become unaffordable for them to live there um, there's so many different uh, issues uh, and opportunities that you know it's really when I look at you know I, I really think of a mixed income neighborhood and I remember when I first started in 2001 I met with the uh, former mayor of Miami Beach and I started talking to him about historic preservation uh, and I'm like why do you why are you preserving all these buildings that aren't really historically significant and not really cool and interesting from an architectural standpoint he's like David because in Miami Beach we believe we want the lower income, middle income, and upper income neighborhoods and people living together because that's what's gonna make the best society. And, uh, and you're right, the land use policies uh, of the past had very bad intentions and bad motives. And, and we're sometimes, we, we never really redid the code. We're trying to just fix the, the, that old code for a lot of jurisdictions. So, so I think, um, you know, I'm, it's probably, Overtown's probably the most amazing um, neighborhood uh, for me to do, and we have 
probably 30 different projects we're working in different municipalities and and but it's uh, been uh, very rewarding and there's some amazing uh, people that are doing some amazing work there uh, and so I think the the question is how is it that a student at Booker T or a student at Frederick Douglass walks out of school and says that's my community and I'm so proud that I'm part of that that's that's the question that and that's what you know the goal is so uh, just uh, you know, working through testing a lot of ideas, um, and uh, and trying to you know do the right thing and and think of development in a more conscious way uh, rather than a pure economic way. But at the same time, you know, we have to see how we could um, hack that that yield analysis because if not, uh, a lot of these neighborhoods are just going to stay as is and. Uh, and we don't want them to go with the wrong direction, but at the same time, we want them to build equity in the people that are there. And that's something that we got to figure out together. So. And I know that's, Alexis, been one of the main charges of HUD, right? How do we make it more affordable for developers to develop these buildings? And, you know, the cost of them, the, the profit margins are lower, but now we need them to be more climate resilient than we needed them to be 30 years, which makes them more expensive. How does HUD help uh, close that gap and make these more, uh, more investable opportunities? Uh, thank you so much for the question. I was going to chime in anyways and just say, you know, uh, my being silent during the last conversation was very intentional because land use is local, right? And the decisions that are happening happen in the community from the people who are in the community and who are making those decisions. And so from the federal government's perspective um, and from HUD's perspective, it's about setting the table, right? It's about providing the opportunities, the technical assistance to be able to take advantage and to invest in a way that makes sense for the community. I didn't mention previously, but you know, HUD does have a citizen participation toolkit. All of the funds that we give out, right, through our block grants and our different funding programs all require community engagement as part of them. And so there are opportunities for folks in the community to participate as those plans are being drawn and developed to make sure that their voices are heard. As well as now, you know, with all of the funding that has come down under the bipartisan infrastructure law, under the Inflation Reduction Act, there are specific requirements for how those funds are to be spent. 40% um, of them under the president's uh, Justice 40 initiative need to benefit low income and disadvantaged communities. So when you are investing um, in a community, you need to make sure that those funds are being targeted to help and to support uh, disadvantaged communities and people who have been left behind in the past to make sure that they are being lifted up. Uh, in terms of how HUD is helping and supporting in new construction, I talked about how you know there's a lot of effort that is going on um, across all agencies. And when I'm out and having conversations with folks and on panels, I always get the comment, well, this is different. So it's not just HUD at the table. It's the Department of Energy. It's EPA. It's Treasury. It's the Department of Agriculture. We are all coming together to try to figure out how to help the funds that we have work together to make the deepest and most significant impact in communities, to lift communities up and to create a climate resilient future. And so, you know, we have different pots of money that can be used, that can be layered um, with other funding sources. I'm going to go back to, you know, the big elephant in the room as we like to talk about it, the $27 billion that EPA has for the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Um, there will be two sources of investment funds set up from that. One is a $14 billion investment fund, and the other one is a $6 billion accelerator fund. The idea of that is recognizing the financial gap and the challenges with making these projects pencil. Um, ultimately, we don't know who will win those awards. The NOFO, like I said, has closed. Notice of funding opportunity has closed. They are in the process of reviewing those applications. But from HUD's perspective, we are very hopeful, fingers triple crossed, um, that some of those funds go specifically to real estate and to housing and to affordable housing and are able to provide low cost financing from folks that understand how to lend green so that the decision on whether to build conventionally or whether to build green, um, that's not a decision because the cost should be at parity. If not, you get better terms, right, when you are building green. So I'd say, you know, HUD and other agencies are really trying to think holistically across like the whole development spectrum in terms of how to engage the community, make sure that their voices are being heard, as well as help and support climate resilient housing. The other thing I just want to, you know, talk about, I mentioned in my remarks about the research and uh, development effort that's going on. You know, the Department of Energy, the fact that their last earth shot, as they call them, is focused on affordable housing, is really critical. What it means is that they are throwing the weight of the national labs behind the idea of how do we bring down the cost of these technologies in homes to make it again so the decision isn't what I put in my home, right, in terms of it being energy efficient or not energy efficient. 
The cost is at parity, if not less expensive. The greenhouse gas emissions are lower. The energy costs are lower. So when we talk about an uncertain climate future and we're concerned about the rising costs of utilities, the ability to have a more efficient home means that your energy should cost less, which means more money in your pocket so that you're not having to make the decision between do I get my medicine or buy my food or pay my electricity bill. So these are all big you know, discussions that are happening, not just at one agency, but across the entire federal family. And so, you know, I am very excited and inspired about the potential and the opportunity, but it also all comes back down to the community and what the community wants and the ability to uptake these resources. And so that's why we're excited about being here at the Aspen Institute to, you know, kick off um, a little preview panel um, for what's going to happen next April, because we think these conversations are very important and we are just thrilled to see housing and climate being talked about um, across all kinds of sectors. I think there's a million more topics we could get into, energy efficiency, retrofits, lots more. But I want to throw it open to you guys and take some questions if you've got them. Otherwise, I think we can keep going. But yeah, please raise your hand if you've got some. I don't know if there's a mic making its way around the room. If not, I can hand this one off. I see the woman in the second row right here. Is there a mic that we should be handing or project? for hardworking Americans that feel priced out, that actually allows them to stabilize their home ownership, you know, their home expenses. And I need, um, I want to speak to the gentleman that spoke about affordability, that if people supported something like this, it would expand access consumers to builders, to bankers, to et cetera, right? So, we can do it in creating communities, but we also have to inform, especially our younger people, and give them hope because many of them do not believe that they're ever going to be able to purchase a home, let alone one that won't blow away in the next storm. And then the other thing I wanted to say was, I'm from New York City, and I know when I'm driving into a, a community of color because there are no trees, there, are no, there isn't any grass. It is not beautiful. I live in a place, I li came here because it's beautiful. But I know that community um, people that look like me don't always experience that. So plant some grass and some trees in our communities and that will be useful to us as well. Okay, that's it, thank you. Can I just say something to that real quick? I thought based off of what you were sharing and then you brought it up, I thought it was so good because I think it is so important to pass on this information sharing. I went to a conference from Brownfields um, this past year and my mind was open to all of like these tax credits and how developers are putting these projects together. I'm like, we, we do need to hack the system. Like community really ha has the power to change entire communities. Like we have the power to change entire communities, but we need to know that it's there and we need to know how to use it. We need to know what's like, how do we put this stuff together, right? And so I think what you're saying and what you're saying is exactly right. Like passing on this information, sharing to know how do I get access to this funds? Even if it's something like weatherization for my house, right? Like for folks that are elderly that need weatherization, there's funding for that, right? But if we don't know, if the community is unaware of it, how will we be able to access it and take the self-determination that we want for the brighter future that we have, so. Oh, and I just wanna say on weatherization, it was plussed up under the bipartisan infrastructure law and is now $5 billion so, with a B. So it was $1.5 billion, it's now $5 billion. So when we talk about funding, this is real money that is out there and accessible. And where is it going? Who is it going to? And if we don't know that it exists in community, if we don't know, in Overtown, it's not going to go to us, right? And so we do have to highlight that. Um, thank you. I, I'll stand. That'll make it easier for you all. Um, my name is Morgan Spencer. I work for the American Red Cross, and I jumped on this because this is exactly the question I wanted to ask. Um, patchwork responses. We've heard from all of you. There's and my friend that I sat next to and met today pointed out there's a million municipalities that are all trying to do their own thing. That often leaves people behind. But so does large scale conveners like HUD, Deloitte, even the American Red Cross. Large scale folks leave folks behind. 
Um, so what are some practical lessons that you all have seen that is bridging that gap between scalability and communities not getting that seat at the table? Practical things that you've seen, maybe good stories that you've heard of how we get this message to, you know, the granny who needs her, <laughs> her air conditioner replaced, you know, so thanks. That's good. I can take a stab at that. Um, so there's uh, some amazing organizations like locally here, but also like the Climate Justice Alliance has a, a just transition and a disaster resilience like working group that's in several different cities all across um, the nation. Um, but speaking locally, um, right, I think it is resiliency hubs, right? And so as we're talking about in community, there are several community organizations like the Smell Trust, like Smash, like Catalyst, right, that are involved in getting disaster resilience kits together that have uh, community hubs where folks can go. Um, Smile Trust has a beautiful location. If you wanna travel around Miami, you're not from here, go check them out in Liberty City. Um, and they have a beautiful location, right, where they have on-site medical care, where they're having, uh, you know, this, this hub for resources, for food, um, where we can take care of our own communities in the gap, right? Because as you shared, if you're in Homestead, oh, you are the last person to get any sort of support from FEMA. You are at the very bottom, right, um, of Miami-Dade County. And so what does it look like for us to create those hubs all around our county um, to support our communities um, with the resources that we need? Um, there's also uh, CERT trainings as well, so community emergency response trainings that we do um, here in Miami-Dade County. Catalyst has done a few. Um, we're training up community leaders on how do we respond in the midst of an emergency. Um, so we're trying to meet this gap with we have what we need in community. And as we come together through mutual aid, as we come together um, as a collective, we can supply what it is that we need to meet those gaps when the other folks may fall short um, in the midst of a disaster, for example. So I'm just thinking about resiliency hubs for disasters, for example. Uh, and then I'll just say, you know, at HUD, we talk a lot about trusted partners. And so again, you know, it is the community on the ground and it's places like your church right? It's, it's uh, places like your doctor, right? And so again, that cross-pollinization that is happening um, at the federal level and hopefully is also translated down into the local level, making sure that during a heat event, for example, right, that the doctors not only know about, right, the potential impact, but that the church also is talking about it, that other places where people are, the schools, right? How do we educate and inform folks on the issues, the opportunities, and where to go to get the help um, or the resources. And I think at HUD, it is a conversation that we are certainly having on how to make sure that we are getting this information out to trusted partners by working with our other agencies, by working with our community partners um, to make sure that the information and the knowledge is out there. And can I just add one more quick thing to that? I think too, in terms of the education sharing, um, shameless plug on Catalyst, but even at our CLEAR program, um, it's open to everyone. It's a free program where we have over 700 graduates that are taking action in Miami-Dade County that have that are learning about what are the solutions that we can take action on, what are the issues, and how do we solve them. And so places like that where we are connecting with other trusted partners, where we're creating this kind of cohesive space to have these discussions is another um, really big way too. There, there are a number of federal programs that are difficult because the money goes directly to a state agency that has very strict rules about it, right? But there are a lot of other federal programs. HUD's Community Development Block Grant Program is a great example of this because the money goes to um, units of local government as well as states, uh, what they call entitlement communities. And that money can get reallocated out into communities and the communities themselves decide what they want to do. HUD's saying, hey, here's the rules around it but you come back to us in your action plan and tell us what you want to do with this money. And if it fits in with these rules, a certain percentage of it um, has to go to low income and moder moderate income communities. They, you know, there are various and sundry rules. But you get to decide what happens with that money. And that's where that decision making can, can flow down. Um, you have other programs. Uh, EPA has a new program that they're gonna be rolling out around um, the Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights is gonna push money into local community groups, into those faith-based organizations and those local groups to help address some of these issues. So there's, there's a lot of money in the, the new legislation in Bill and IRA that, that is gonna flow down, but 
people have to learn about it and they have to organize and ask questions and they will get that information because federal agencies are trying to push that information out, but they don't know what they don't know. I think we've got time for one more question. I saw one more hand back here. Yes. yes. Hi. Good afternoon and thank you all for your time for such a vibrant discussion this afternoon. My name is Jane Marie Russell. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for Food Rescue uh, US, South Florida. We rescue food from hotels, restaurants, and grocery stores that would otherwise be going into landfills and instead deliver, deliver it to nonprofits that are feeding the food insecure. We've saved over 8 million pounds of food out of land from going into landfills since 2018. Um, my question is geared more towards food insecurity, which is an issue that is so closely related to having access to affordable housing and then in the context of the work that we do, combating climate change and addressing our never-ending issue with enough landfill space in Miami-Dade County. Um, my question is more geared towards Josh and David in working with the private sector as far as uh, the word incentives has been used a lot this afternoon in addressing how do we engage with with the private sector and the community to do the right thing. Because at the end of the day, for a lot of people in the private sector, it is the dollars that drive decisions, decision making. So the work that we do is amazing. We bring fresh produce and food that people in black and brown communities, mostly in Miami, don't have access to because we have so many food deserts, which are, again, a legacy of redlining and uh, zoning issues, uh, zoning uh, decisions made over the last um, countless decades. How is it that when you are building affordable housing or looking to make these great investments like more green spaces in communities that have needed that investment for decades, how do you then also work with bringing in like grocery stores or you know access to healthcare like what Destiny was talking about? Um, those things that cause and exacerbate all of the other issues that aren't just related to having a roof over your head. Let me do macro and you can talk Thank you. About it a little bit lower. So there are two things that big companies care about. Um, obviously, um, making money is one of them, right? Because if it's a for-profit company and you're not making money, you're not in business and you will be replaced. Um, that's just the reality of it. It's, it's the way that the, the system works. The other is what their customers think about them. They're, they're their brand value, their goodwill. The reason that tech companies got into clean energy very early on was not because it penciled out, but because their customers cared about this issue and demanded that they do it. Um, and they were way out in front of everybody else before it made financial sense. Um, when you can talk to, and consumers have, especially consumer-facing companies like grocery stores and you know anything that's, that's consumer-facing, um, they care what their customers think. And if their customers express an interest in something, because that's the brand loyalty piece that they're looking for. Um, all of their advertising is based on that, right? We want you to feel good about your purchase. Um, and so that's one way you can get to them is working through the community groups to say, hey, we care about this and you should too. Um, you know, retailers are always looking to uh, looking at occupancy costs and looking at growth and trends that are what what's happening in a given neighborhood. And uh, and you're right that uh, neighborhoods that may not have the income levels or the density, right? Uh, it's very difficult to attract them. Uh, in in one development that we're doing, we basically dedicated around 20% of all the retail square footage to mission-based causes. Uh, one's a, so, a strong social work program. One's uh, you know a, a certain startup uh, local operator that wants to do a food hall like so the struggle we have and and uh, you know I see our our housing director here from uh, Miami-Dade County the struggle we have is a lot of the affordable housing we're building always has ground floor retail uh, but it's it's empty uh, we there's a there's a development in in, in uh, Overtown that uh, that that affordable housing development and and I call the owner I'm like you have like 20,000 square feet of ground floor space that you could be activating, creating so many amazing, great things for the community and, and even make some money. Uh, and, oh, I didn't want to, I don't want to be bothered, right, by 
um, by, um, you know, the noise and the whatever. And then my residents complain and I'm like, are you seriously saying this? Um, but I think, I think that, um, I think there, it's a little bit of a mix. I think if, you know, I think HUD does finance primarily affordable housing projects that also could have a mixed use component uh, and having certain performance metrics maybe within those those financing in order to actually require, you know, to pay leasing commissions, pay tenant improvements in order to open up a store or something in that community. Uh, I don't know if that's possible, that, but that's just one idea. But for us, um, you know, especially when, when we're in a, a neighborhood that, that needs a lot and, and has a lot of requirements and resources that, that are lacking, I think trying to allocate a percentage of that to a mission-based kind of retail use, I think would, would help. Uh, but, but, and again, like you were saying, just, you know, I think, um, you know, you know, I'd love to learn more about your organization because I think it's, it's great because I, I just can see how much waste we have in, <laughs> in, uh, in food throughout our community. So, uh, it's, uh, smart, but anyways, thanks. We're asking you one more question before we roll. This gentleman not, here. Not a question. So thank you for that segue, David. Alex Baina, Director of Public Housing and Community Development on behalf of, uh, our mayor, Daniela Levinkava, you know, she's very passionate about this topic, uh, not only from the housing component, but as a community at large. And everything that everybody's saying here is correct. And we're at the forefront of trying to accomplish a lot of these goals. Uh, I know I spoke with Alex uh, last week, right? On one of the initiatives that we're doing, which is around cooling, right? You know, one of our, our um, items that we have with HUD, right? That we don't have to provide AC for our units here in Miami-Dade County, right? So that's probably a good one to, to, to write down there. So. Um, I'll be here for a little bit. I'm sorry I'm late. I was at Liberty Square doing a groundbreaking for phase four and a lot of the topics that we were speaking about here, trees and encompassing a lot of solutions to the community to improve the neighborhood. But thank you for, for having me. All right, thank you guys so much. I think we're gonna wrap it up there. I think some of us may stick around for some more questions. We've got it. Thank you so much for your attention to this really important topic and thanks to our speakers.